Dear Lord, how can we thank you enough for all that you have given us? We have so much, more than enough to supply all of our needs. As we present our tithes and offerings today, make us mindful of the people whose earthly needs we are called to supply. In deepest gratitude, we offer ourselves back to you for your service and your will. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The scripture reading today is Luke six twenty-seven through 31. Love your enemies. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. Thank you, Carrie. So today, um, you might have noticed I have a little bit of nerves going on, but I'm feeling calmer now that I'm through the other pastoral duties and I want to start today by prefacing what's, what I'm going to be talking about with the fact that, as you know, I'm not your pastor, and I'm actually just a school teacher. And so Pastor Randy asked me a few months back if when they went to annual conference, if I would be willing to, you know, just share a little bit. And um, I didn't really know what I was getting myself into until uh, just this week when I talked to him Tuesday morning Um, because I wasn't sure if it was still happening, but I'm very excited that I have this opportunity to be up here today and to get to share. So um, brace yourselves. This may be a little non-traditional at points, but um, I think the the message, uh, it's about Jesus' love, and the scripture that Carrie just read today is Luke's interpretation of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount and how we should always do unto others as we would have them do unto us. So just like with the kids, um, so you'll be nice to me today. I need you to put your hands up. Hope you're paying attention. Everybody ready? Okay, here we go. Do unto others as you would have them. Two words, do unto you. So now that we have on our golden gloves, like Mrs. Gifford taught me in the fifth grade, That was the year when the Challenger went up and exploded. My dad helped me win the icebox contest in fifth grade. The drinking fountains overflowed, so I got to work in the hall for weeks at a time. It was a great year um, as as a kid. I felt lots of love and just have great memories. So what I want to do is I'm going to talk about school, and I'm going to talk about a project that my students just finished up this spring. And it was called The Happiness Project. Uh, We do project-based learning, and I teach in the Academy of Global Studies at Winton Woods High School. So we look globally around the world at what people do and and all of that. So I had a challenge. I had to figure out how to get Hamlet, Shakespeare's Hamlet, a tragedy, to fit with industrialization. And there are lots of terms in industrialization like GDP and dystopia and things like that. And so I started thinking, well, Hamlet's not a very happy guy. And in the world, what would, what would have made him happy? And how can I connect this to the social studies curriculum? So when I began doing my research, I came across the World Happiness Report. Has anybody ever heard of that? It, it came out back in 2011. So the United Nations started collecting data so that they could see where in the world people were most happy. And so the UN used six different variables to determine happiness. One was GDP, income, um, and then freedom, being able to choose to do what you want that makes you happy. Uh, the third variable is trust, like corrupt, lack of corruption in your country. The fourth variable is health, life expectancy. And then the last two, um, one is social support, having friends and family to support you. And then the sixth one is generosity, 
being able to do kind things for others and share with others. So poor Hamlet, he, uh, he didn't have much social support after his, his uncle murdered his dad and his mom married his uncle and all that stuff. He got to that to be or not to be bit and he was just a sad guy. Um, he had Rosencrantz and Guildenstern and then his girlfriend's dad Polonius spying on him all the time. So he, he just didn't have that support he needed. He had all the money in the world. He was a prince, but, but nothing made him happy. So my students were able to kind of put that together, and they, did a, they created a global happiness fair, and they actually had a lot of um, information on how to support each other and how to make each other feel happy so they wouldn't end up like Hamlet. And so when we began this project, I had the kids start with what we call an entry event, and I put those six variables up on posters around the room, and I had the get kids get up and move to different parts of the room and kind of rate, you know, which did they think would make people most happy. Can you guess where the majority of them went? Money, exactly. Most of them went straight to money. A few of them went to uh, health, life expectancy, because they said, well, if you have money, you'll live a long life which kind of made sense. There were a few girls, a group of girls mostly, who went to social support because friends matter and all their little Snapchats and Instagrams and stuff. And I only had one student out of all of them go to doing kind things for others, generosity, which I thought was kind of sad. So I I got determined. how, How can we turn this around? You know, how can, in a public school... Can I just kind of bring a little bit of Jesus' love for us into the classroom? Um, So we went through the project. We did the curriculum. Everything was on par. And toward the end, I decided that I would go ahead and bring Netflix in the class because they were trying to watch it on their phones anyway. So I figured if I put it up on the big screen and put something from Netflix that they would like, uh, they'd pay attention. So there's a documentary, and you could watch it if you have a Netflix account. It's simply called Happy. And the background is blue with clouds in the sky. And in this documentary, they examine uh, what makes people happy. And one of the, the things that struck me initially is they showed a big pie graph. And they said that 50% of all your happiness is genetic. It comes from just your genes. It's just the way you're born. They then had a small sliver, only 10%, only 10% was based on your circumstances, your income, your social status, your age, where you live. That was only 10% of what made people happy. And that really was backed up in in the film because they show the man, he was a rickshaw driver in India, and his family was, by our standards, dirt poor, and they didn't have walls on their house, and they barely sometimes had rice to eat. But he was probably one of the happiest guys in the whole documentary. And so were all of his children and family. And they were really closely tight-knit. And I thought that was really cool. That said a lot. And then there's intentional activity. Intentional activity. So we've got 50% genetics, 10% circumstances, 40% is then your intentional activities. What you choose to do. Who you choose to be with. Um, things that help you find your flow, things that make you feel good. And I feel like in that category is where emotional support, friends, family, your church family, and generosity, missions, doing kind things for others would fall in. Um, So whether you're a little nine-year-old kid striking out little leaguers, or a 94-year-old uh, great-grandfather watching your son in a Memorial Day baseball tournament, it's what you choose to do and who you choose to be with that make you the happiest. And so today, um, this is where I'm going to go a little rogue, because Pastor Andy said I could do whatever I wanted. I can't believe he told me that. He said, I know you're creative, so here, here it is. Here's the, the, big, the big boom. So this year, and I'll talk about this later, I had kind of, I've had a hard time um, at work uh, in a way. And so there was something that really made me happy this year. 
And it was Lila and Lily, uh, my daughter and my, my niece, uh, they decided that they were going to do something special to surprise all of their grandmas. And so we had to keep this a secret. I'm not the best secret keeper when I'm really excited about something, but I tried really hard. Um, so uh, they got up there, and Jackie, of course, already bought a program and was looking through it. But what Lila and Lily did is they did a duet this year in dance. And the song that they did the duet for, for their grandmothers, is Hallelujah. So rather than just describing this and blabbing on forever, I'm going to have Lila and Lily come forward right now, please. And today, um, this has been here for 25 years. I've never really seen this happen, but I thought, you know, Pastor Andy's at Lakeside, so we're going to spice it up a little bit. And Lila and Lily are going to do a, um, a version. They're, they can, you can take your shoes off. They're going to do a version of this dance because this is where their flow is. You'll see how happy this makes them. And it brought a lot of happiness to grandparents and judges and the hundreds of people who saw them when they competed in this. And in the last um, competition, they actually got a performance award, which meant that they, they told a story and it was emotional. And I thought it would be cool, and Kelly actually thought it would be cool, to work this into the sermon. So here you go. Thank you. 